It's mid-afternoon on the 15th of November, 2007. On the ramp at the Arlington, Texas airport, a flight instructor and two foreign students, one receiving instruction, the other riding along to gain experience in radio communication, are preparing for a cross-country flight in a Piper Aero. The day is calm and clear, and there's no outward sign that this will be anything other than a routine trip. Behind the facade of normality, though, lie disturbing indications of what's to come. The instructor for the flight, though relatively inexperienced, has gained a reputation as a quote-unquote good pilot, albeit one with a certain reckless streak, namely a fondness for aerobatic maneuvers in non-aerobatic aircraft. Later testimony from his fellow CFIs, corroborated by emails from one of the students killed in the crash, describes multi-turn spins, barrel rolls, wingovers, and aggressive pull-ups in normal category aircraft, hardly the stuff of typical flight instruction. Shortly before the flight, another CFI, the primary instructor for the student riding along to observe, cautions her colleague not to do any funny stuff. The warning, however, seems to be given more out of concern that the student will pick up bad habits than over worries about danger. Either way, it goes unheeded. The arrow departs Arlington westbound, and from there, ATC radar tells the tale. Analysis shows the aircraft performing several maneuvers in the moments leading up to the crash. Most of the maneuvers begin with pitchovers, in which altitude is rapidly traded for airspeed, most likely in preparation for aerobatic maneuvers, though due to the imprecise nature of radar evidence, this cannot be determined definitively. At 3.03 p.m., the aircraft makes one last climb to 11,800 feet before pitching over. Its airspeed peaks at 135 knots, well above maneuvering speed, and has just begun to decrease when radar contact is abruptly lost. On the ground, witnesses describe hearing an engine cutting in and out, along with whirling sounds, and a loud bang as the aircraft falls to the ground in pieces. This is an admittedly extreme example of what can happen when unsafe practices are left unchecked. Such recklessness is rare in the world of flight instruction. And yet, despite its egregiousness, the accident is instructive. For one, it shows how dangerous one bad apple can be, both in the obvious physical sense and in the potential to influence the behavior of others. But it also points to an uncomfortable truth, one that's perhaps more broadly relevant than we'd like to admit. When the peers of a rogue pilot stand idly by, they implicitly endorse his behavior. In this case, other CFIs clearly knew what was going on, and they certainly knew that it was both illegal and dangerous. One or two voiced concerns, but nothing further was done. Friendly warnings from peers are relatively easy to brush off. At a minimum, those who had concerns should have followed up to make sure that things had changed. If they hadn't, a discussion with flight school management would have been appropriate, and from there, perhaps even stronger measures. It's easy to follow the path of least resistance, to overlook safety issues, to go along to get along, to carry on with business as usual. Following a different path requires action, difficult choices, and sometimes even courage. But as more of us do it, the easier it gets for everyone and the less often we have to hear about accidents like this one. 